everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started uh, with a few announcements. Hello, I'm Anthony. I'm gonna be your moderator for this session. Uh, first, I wanted to let you all know that we will be recording this session and it will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the con Congress ends. If you would like to ask any of your speakers a question during their, uh, their presentation, please use the Q&A area to the right of your screen. The chat window is also there for you to use to engage with other attendees and, and your presenters. And finally, I want to kindly ask that you all keep your microphones and your cameras off during the presentations and follow the, the lead of your presenters on when to go ahead and engage uh, with your camera or microphone on. So at this time, I wanna go ahead and get us started. I want to pass it over to our first presenter, Hope. Take it away, Hope. Alrighty, hello everyone. My name is Hope Miller. I'm a master's student at the University of Florida studying fire ecology under Dr. Raylene Crandall. I also worked with Southern Fire Exchange for about a year and a half before my grad program as a communications intern. And today I'm here to talk about the fire science needs of Southeastern Extension Ranch. But before I do that, a big thank you to our team. This project could not have happened without the collaboration and expertise between Extension professionals and researchers at the University of Florida, North Carolina State University, and Clemson. Funding for this project comes from the United States Department of Agriculture Renewable Resource Extension Act Grant. All right, so we conducted a needs assessment as part of a larger project entitled Equipping Extension Professionals to Facilitate a Community-Based Approach to Wildland Fire with Prescribed Burn Association. Essentially, that's just a long-winded way of saying we want to increase the capacity of regional extension agents to uh, conduct fire science programming, and then ultimately create PBAs in their communities. And I think this goes well with the theme of social resilience in the face of fire. So to do this, we wanted to answer questions. What are extension agents already doing for fire science programming? What are their needs to better implement programming? And how can our team increase agents' fire science programming capacity? To explore extension agent experiences, with fire and programming. We conducted semi-structured interviews with 10 predetermined questions and then some follow-up probing questions. The semi-structured nature of the interviews allowed us to ask certain questions and explore what we needed to, but then also gave the agents a chance to discuss more in depth anything they wanted and bring up any tangents they felt were important. I think the funniest one I had happen was about the Christmas tree industry in North Carolina. The agent was actually quite appalled that I went out one year and cut down a sand pine in my backyard and used it. So the interviews were audio recorded, transcribed, and then a qualitative data analysis method called content analysis was used on the transcripts to determine frequencies of responses. And then this helped us to determine what was important when answering our questions. And then a little bit about our sampling. We were very intentional in what agents we chose. We picked agents that were already known to conduct fire programming or had an expressed interest in it, either through in-service trainings or just word of mouth. And then after the first few agents, we employed the snowball method where we asked for more recommendations of agents that we could talk to. So we had 22 agents participate in total, very unevenly spread out in the region. We had five in Florida, one in Alabama, two in Georgia, four in South Carolina, seven in North Carolina, one in Texas, and two in Oklahoma. Now I did reach out to other agents in Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and either didn't hear back or they declined to participate. In terms of agent positions, the most common was state regionalized special, or state regional specialized agent, uh, 10 agents. And then we had five county level agriculture and natural resource agents one in education, one agent in livestock, two in forestry and wildlife, two in horticulture, and one county director. And then I really like the quote at the bottom when agent said, I really enjoy dispelling that fear and helping them to understand how important prescribed fire is to our ecology. It was 
really motivating to hear that from the first few agents and to hear the sentiment, sentiment expressed routinely. So the audiences that the agents we talk to uh, work with are very diverse, but overall are pretty receptive to fire information. The most common audience demographic was forest management, mostly non-industrial private forest landowners. And then other common audience demographics included industry associations, homeowners, commercial agriculture, range management, and then a smattering of others. And after that, we asked agents if they personally receive or if they know that their office receives questions related to fire. 18 said yes, two said no, two didn't know, either because they were new to their position and didn't really have a feel for it, or one secretary was just really good at sending questions elsewhere. We also asked if the agents could personally answer these questions with their own knowledge and skills. Eight agents said some of the questions, eight said most of the questions, and two agents were just fire rock stars and could answer all the questions. And the four that didn't receive obviously didn't answer questions. But overall, audiences are receptive. 16 had an emphatic yes, and then six normally. So just as the audiences were diverse, the agents that we talked to had varied experiences with prescribed fire, wildfire, and programming. The most common source of previous experience included previous careers, either as a wildland firefighter or a private forestry consultant. Nine agents had certifications, either through the NWCG or their state prescribed burner certification. Several had courses, higher education courses in fire. A few even had entire theses and dissertations related to fire, which is really cool. A few had family members in fire, either spouses or their parents. And then four agents actually burn their own property currently. And then the most common types of programming that our agents already conduct include workshops, and learn and burns, and then also field tours, certified burner courses, youth environmental education, and a few firescaping programs. All right, so even though our agents have experience, they have knowledge, they still requested more information and training, either for themselves or they saw a need among their colleagues for more information and training. The most requested topics were just general forestry, how fire fits in, pine plantations, that kind of thing, how to conduct on the ground assistance for landowners, where to get burners certified in their state, or wanted to know how fire works with habitat management, specifically for game species. And then four wanted to know how to talk to landowners, particularly the ornery ones that already had their minds made up. And then three wanted to know how to reintroduce fire into long unburned stands. 19 out of 22 agents, which is about 86%, were interested in hands-on training, but had the caveat of only if they could fit it in their schedule and if it was practical to attend. Now, this idea of practicality actually came up quite a bit. Many agents were concerned that the prescribed fire information out there wasn't always practical to their region or the trainings that they saw were either not practical for the agents themselves to attend or put on or for working landowners to attend. So uh, this idea of practicality was actually really stressed and I think is important when moving forward and creating our programs. I also like the quote at the bottom, another agent said, for fire, you have to be on the ground. There's only so much PowerPoint can do for sure. And I just chuckle because here I am in front of you with a PowerPoint, but it's a little more appropriate in this setting. So from the previous slides, we know that agents, they're informed, they're excited to conduct more programming, they wanna learn more, they wanna get out there more. But a lot of the agents said that they experienced quite a few barriers when working with FIRE and their clientele. I arbitrarily made three groups of these barriers and some of them overlap. So barriers come from the job position as an extension agent, the audiences they work with, and then the characteristics that they themselves possess. So reporting quotas, state politics, and job duties and extension agent just made it to where they couldn't get out in the field and they couldn't do time intensive, resource intensive programs. The audiences, obviously if there's a fear of fire, that's a barrier, concerns about smoke, and then distrust of the government as a state agency. 
And then the agents themselves lack time to conduct these programs. Some of them don't have enough technical skill. And then some come from a wrong background or just way out of their league, don't know how to even start. And we'll see some demonstrative quotes of these barriers right here. One agent said, it's just not something that's part of my job with extension. Although I've asked my landowners to invite me to come out if they do a prescribed burn, I would love to help. Another agent said, most of our agents that are doing natural resources come from an animal science background. So a lot of times they have no idea on some of this stuff. And then one more agent said, another barrier is politics. We can provide the best science, but usually the agencies and decision makers are only using public opinion and political direction. So before I get into takeaways, another quote, I thought this was not just a good professional testament, but just a way to lead your life. Be honest, be humble, look them in the eye. If you say you're gonna do something, do it. So takeaways, increasing Southeastern Extension Agents capacity for prescribed fire programming is going to be more difficult than just putting together in-service trainings. Southeastern Extension Agents wanna learn and conduct more programming, but face a variety of challenges from their audiences and institutions. So I think this makes answering our questions at the beginning of how can our team increase capacity makes it a little more nuanced. But I do know that our next steps on the project are creating a online self-paced uh, course to go through general forestry, habitat management, and just some of the other topics that were requested. And the fact that it's online, self-paced, shouldn't take too much time, is trying to get at that practicality. And with that, I talked a little faster than I did in my practices, so I still have some time left. But if you have any questions, now's the time. I also have my email here. And you're, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for your presentation, Hope. Um, I'm currently looking and I don't see any questions quite yet, but because we have a, a bit of time, I want to invite people that if you have a question, feel free to uh, unmute right now and ask your question out loud. Let's have a dialogue. Should I keep my screen up here? You can take it down if you'd like. Does anybody have a question? Uh, hi, hi, Hope. Um, I had a question. I'm in Tennessee, and I was wondering if uh, you said you said you reached out to agents in Tennessee. Were they the ones that uh, ghosted you, or did they actively decline to respond? Um, I don't remember. Actually, I think I just never heard a response. And obviously, I can't say who that'd be an IRB uh, invalidation. But yeah, um, and I understand. I think sometimes my emails got sent to spam for some people. So even if I reached out, they wouldn't see it. But yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for Hope? It looks like there's two questions in the. Ooh, thank you so much. Down. Okay, Hope. Do you foresee more agents focusing solely on fire in the future? Is that a reality? I think it's hard with the way that county extension positions are set up right now. I know South Carolina has specialized fire agents, and I think that needs to become more of a, a widespread thing among institutions so that they can focus solely on fire. Otherwise, I don't see it being reality. Excellent. And the other question says, hey, Hope, do you think this is something that should be addressed with institutions, uh, i.e. RX fire courses being required for wild wildlife and other major other and other major majors other than forestry. Sorry. 
That's a good question. Um, I think it really depends on kind of the need in the area. If a certain extension area doesn't receive many questions about habitat or fire mitigation, then maybe it would be a waste of time and resources, but also it's kind of interesting just to learn as much as you can. Um, I think it's a case by case basis and I don't have the authority to make policy decisions like that. But it'd be cool if everyone did learn about fire. I'm a proponent for that. I apologize. I just asked you a question on me. <laughs> <laughs> Generally speaking, did agents seem excited or interested in new fire trainings? Did you see much for a variability in interest among states? Mm. So I haven't looked at responses parceled out by state. Um, I do know that the amount of background knowledge and training that the agents already had, they were less inclined to be excited. Um, they did have some pretty niche topics that they requested, like fire and salamander habitat, which I think would be pretty cool. But yeah, I don't know by state. I can definitely look at it and um, give you like a percentage by state. If that's something you're interested in, you can email me. Excellent, thank you. All right, I'm looking for another question. Not seeing any other ones yet. All right, so we're gonna do one last call for any questions for Hope. Um, you can chat them or you can unmute right now and speak directly to Hope if you would like. It's funny, every time I practiced, I went over time. So I guess I sped talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a little different, right? All right. Well, thank you so much, Hope. I appreciate you. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presentation. Um, Laurel, I want to go ahead and get you set up. Um, let's go ahead and wait um, about a little, about two minutes before we actually get started on it. But um, I do want to make sure that everyone who is coming to hear your presentation is able to make it. Um, but it looks like you're all ready to go. Sounds good. Just let me know when you want me to start. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, Laurel, I have you all ready to go. Go ahead and get started. All right, so thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Laurel Kays. I work at NC State Extension Forestry um, and part of my duties there are helping to coordinate outreach for the Southern Fire Exchange. Um, and myself and Hope, who you just heard from, are gonna talk a little bit about a project that we worked on when she was still with us. 
um, where we put together a Reddit Ask Me Anything with one of our researchers, Dr. Raylene Crandall. Um, and hopefully we're gonna convince you that this is something you should think about doing if you're a researcher um, or think about coercing one of your researchers into doing if you are an outreach person. Um, so we'll give you a little bit of background, talk about what Reddit is and what an Ask Me Anything means, talk a little bit about our planning process, um, how we actually got this done and some lessons learned. So for those who are uninitiated, you're probably fortunate um, and you've probably saved a lot of your free time. Reddit is kind of a social media platform. Um, it's really more of a collection of individual message boards. There are anywhere from hundreds of thousands to millions of these, depending on which source you look at, but needless to say, very, very many. Um, and each of these boards, which are called subreddits, are focused on different topics. So they can be very broad. You can see the screenshot there showing um, the kind of main landing page for at some point in the past. Um, you can see world news and movies are two of the subreddits. So they can be super broad like that. They can be more narrowly focused, like there are usually ones for individual states or large municipalities or cities. There's one for Raleigh, there's one for North Carolina. Um, or they can be very, very small and very, very niche. There's a subreddit for people who keep backyard chickens, for example. Um, so it really varies. And the way the platform works is you make an account and you choose which of these subreddits you want to join or follow. And so you log on and you see posts from those subreddits to which you're subscribed. You can also go to the main page, which is what that screenshot is showing you, um, which shows you kind of the top posts from the entire website. Um, and the way that things are considered a top post or dictated, you know, who sees them is that you can upvote and downvote posts. So that, let's see, does it say, so that, that top one in the screenshot that says 73.5 thousand, um, that means that that's kind of the net upvotes. So if someone downvotes something, it subtracts one from that. Um, the platform tends to skew younger than a lot of typical platforms like Facebook that we typically use for social media outreach. It's one of the very few platforms that has actually grown significantly amongst US adults in terms of its use over the past couple of years. And folks who are active on the platform tend to be very active on the platform. They spend significant time there engaging with it. Um, and so that makes it a really good place to think about doing some sort of outreach. And an Ask Me Anything is a pretty great ready-made way to do that. So an Ask Me Anything or an AMA is a pretty well understood convention on, on the platform. Pretty much everyone knows what that means. And what it means is that a person or people, a group, make a post that describes their area of expertise or an experience or something about them that makes them interesting and invites people to ask them questions about that particular topic. Um, so you can see some of the screenshots here. These vary really widely. It could be a celebrity or a sports star. It could be someone who just has a really interesting experience like the ones you see here. Um, a World War II veteran who is 100 years old, that lobster diver who got swallowed by a whale. They vary pretty widely. Um, and researchers often do them as well. Um, to, we worked with some of the University of Florida communications folks. I think Hope will talk a little bit more about this. Um, they had worked with one of their researchers who does research on bees to do one of these. Um, and these can be posted on any of those message boards called subreddits, but there is also one exclusively devoted to these events, um, which is where we ended up doing ours. So this is part of a broader effort um, within Southern Fire Exchange to kind of reach out to some new and diverse audiences, engage places we haven't really previously engaged. Um, and Wild and Fire also frequently shows up on this platform a lot. Reddit's pretty United States centric. Um, so folks from all around the world have accounts and there's content devoted to that, but it's pretty US centric. Um, and so when Fire is in the news in the Western United States or even in Australia, um, that topic shows up pretty prominently on the front page of the platform, people posting about those wildfires, posting about what's going on. Um, and so we decided this would be a good place for us to engage, to get some information out there about prescribed fire, about the interactions between that and wildfire, what we do here in the South, um, while that was kind of a, a big topic of conversation on the platform already. So we worked with Dr. Raylene Crandall, who I think I saw, yeah, she is on, hi, right. Um, she's University of Florida faculty. She's our Southern Fire Exchange PI. 
She has experience both as a researcher and also a field person actually being a wildland firefighter. Um, and I promise I'm not just saying this because she's on here, but she's a really great type of researcher to work with for this sort of things. She's really great at engaging with people, at explaining things in an understandable, exciting, interesting way, um, and is really great at communicating the science to a wide variety of folks and was excited about the idea of doing this. So all of those things were really important to us. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over to Hope to talk a little bit more about how we actually did this um, and kind of what came out of it. Thank you, Laurel. So logistics wise, um, in our new Zoom world, we and we're also spread out across the Southeast region, our team is, we created a Zoom command center so we could interact in real time. We had a Google document where we would survey the site for questions and then place them in the Google Doc. And because we had multiple people on the team, everyone could go in and start answering questions. Beforehand, we tried to prepare a little bit. This was actually a tip from the communications people that we talked to at the University of Florida. They said to create um, a list of questions that you anticipate, any like common questions um, just about wildfire, prescribed fire, and then also a database of external sources that we linked to. And a lot of it, since we were with Southern Fire Exchange, were fact sheets and things like that. And so it was really nice already having prepared answers. So if we did receive some of those questions, we could just go maybe edit some of the wording to tailor it to the question, but then we could just go and paste it and just move through the questions. To get more engagement and more traffic on our posts, we cross-posted, which is kind of like sharing, I guess, um, to related subreddits. I know we did the University of Florida one, an ecology-specific one, and then I think the most niche one was forestry specific. And we actually got some engagement on each of those like shared posts. And then some people came over onto the main post and engaged with us as well. And having this team, one person scanned all of these different places. We had posts in like four or five different pages. So it was a lot to keep track of. So one person was in charge of looking for questions and putting them into the Google Doc. And then everyone else helped answer. Sometimes it was a team effort. It was kind of a long or intricate question. We kind of like use each other as a sounding board. And then the same person that was scanning for questions helped copy and paste and reply. And I'll just add too that this was technically Ray's AMA. She was the person who was you know, doing it. So she approved all of the answers before we actually posted them. Um, and we all work fairly closely together. So we know each other pretty well, but we did make sure that she read over everything and was an active part of answering it um, so that we weren't you know, speaking for her in a way she wasn't comfortable with. Good point. So outcomes, we actually had a pretty good turnout. Uh, we had 1800 upvotes, which is similar to the likes on Facebook or LinkedIn. And we had 174 comments, which 174 questions. Um, to the left here, you can see a screenshot of what our original post looked like on the page. We had a, an engaging, bold title that was supposed to just outline who our expert was and what we were going to talk about. And then we kind of went in. The edit was after we were done. It was like, okay, we're done answering questions, but you can come here for more information. And then, yeah, we had a little bio on our expert, on Ray, and just some links to some more inform informational sources. And the questions, it was actually really interesting. We had some very basic ones. You'll see some examples down there at the bottom, such as how do you get into fire and what's the coolest thing you've seen. But because we posted on some niche places like the forestry specific and ecology, we had some really interesting ecology and like operational questions we actually had some previous or current wildland firefighters that asked about, you know, smoke, smoke impacts and retardant impacts on firefighters. And so it was interesting to get those. And also I feel like some of the questions we couldn't really answer and that's where our external sources came in. We had very few rude people or spam comments, which 
was kind of a fear. Reddit, I think, is known to be kind of like a weird place of the internet, so we weren't really sure how it was going to go, but in general, it was very wholesome. I think the funniest question we got was uh, if we preferred Tom Petty or another Gainesville-based band. And we're like, well, we're not partial. They're both good. The other Gainesville-based band being Less Than Jake for those who are ska fans. I'll also mention to you that the subreddit has moderators. And we, since we posted on a fairly large one, they have moderators whose job it is in part to um, remove comments that are inappropriate or off topic. So I don't think we got a lot of those, but any that we did get would have you know, gone through that sort of filter too. Very wholesome. So some lessons learned. Having a team was so nice, it was instrumental. Uh, you saw that we had 174 comments and a lot of them came in within like an hour span. So that was a lot. And having to search the other places where we posted or the other subreddits that we cross posted on, that took a lot of time. And my email account was linked to it. So I got notifications anytime someone commented, even for like two weeks after I would get notifications because I didn't know how to turn it off. So just having a team and divvying up responsibilities was really good. It helped us stay afloat and stay on top of it. Posting on a large subreddit is good. Um, you get that engagement. They already have this following. It also seems a little more legitimate when you post on the actual AMA page. And then you can cross post to draw in more of your niche audiences. Um, choose a date and time when users are active and interest is high. So for some reason, I don't know the science or the metrics behind it, but Thursdays at noon are just a highly trafficked time. And so that's what we shot for. We also did it during or in late July. So that's, you know, high California wildfire season, Western wildfire season. And I think in particular, the Dixie fire was really taking off. So fire was very publicized at the time. It was really relevant. Uh, be flexible. So we chose a two hour period. We logged on to Zoom a little early, kind of like got our game faces on. And then we were gonna answer questions for an hour, hour and a half. And then we actually stayed longer because we kept getting questions and it was really enjoyable. And I don't know if Ray did, but I know some other experts even go back for like a couple of days every once in a while and just kind of answer questions. And there's no need to be nervous. It's a good time, especially if you're good buddies with your team. Um, some of the things that you get asked, you're just kind of like, what is this? And you can have a laugh about it. And some recommendations. Uh, definitely consider doing one, especially if your research is really interesting or really re relevant to the public. We wanted to talk about fire. We wanted to get out of our just Southern Fire Exchange practitioner researcher field and engage with a broader audience. Back to the relevancy, timing it right. Uh, we did it during Western Fire, Western Fire season. And so whatever your topic, when it comes into season, consider it doing it then. And just going back to the team, it was really good. Just having someone for logistics, actually corresponding with the Reddit admins, setting up the Zoom meetings, figuring out dates, doodle polls, all that fun stuff, having someone in charge of that, having someone who really knows the platform, uh, Reddit was really confusing to me, and Laurel was our Reddit expert in residence, and she was instrumental in helping us navigate the acronyms and the etiquette and stuff like that. And then technical experts. Um, so we were all pretty knowledgeable in FIRE, but we did lean on uh, Dr. Crandall, our expert researcher, to approve questions and make sure we were getting the, the right idea across. It can also be helpful, especially if you're nervous about it, um, to if you have friends who are willing to make an account or already have one, to give them some seed questions. We didn't really end up needing them, but it was nice to know we had that backup um, to help it like get a little bit of traction and start showing up on other people's feeds. Again, we didn't end up really needing those people to do that, but it was good to have that in our back pocket. I just thought of another thing, talking about having a niche question or audience. Um, we actually had another fire researcher from another institution start answering questions for us. And we were all like, do you know this person? So that was kind of interesting to see that we got that in kind of engagement as well. So yeah, um, kind of a, a spin on the ask me anything. If you have any questions, we're here, ask us anything.
Thank you both so much. I'm going to take a look at the Q&A and see if we have any, any questions. Okay, we have a few coming in. So uh, the first question is, is this a first, or I'm sorry, is this a time limited engagement? Oh, sorry, hold on, let me read the question. You said you did a two hour session. Sorry, Beth, I'm sorry. Would you mind unmuting and speaking with us? Sorry, I wanna make sure that we understand your question. Sure, I, 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 I'm I just completely new to Reddit. I don't know anything about it. And so it sounds like you are prepared to answer questions that come in for two hours. And, and then you said more can come in later that you can answer. I, I'm really confused about how, how this is set up. Yeah. And no, so, David, no, David, I don't want to do one. <laughs> 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 it sounds really time, time, um, time consuming. <laughs> yeah. And it really, it re when we describe it, it does sound a lot more time consuming than I think it really was. Um, so what we did and Hope was the one who did this. So definitely chime in, but we scheduled this with the moderator. So she created the account we were going to use messaged them and was like, hey, we would like to do this. We would like to schedule it for noon on X date. And they said, okay. Um, so we like had that time already to go or prearranged with them. Um, so we, you know, we had plans to answer questions together as our team all together for that two hour time block. Um, we after, and we did end up staying on a little bit later than that. But when that dedicated time block was over. We edited the post. We're like, thank you everyone. Like we're done answering questions for now. Here's where you can find us kind of thing. Um, and you can, if you choose to, I don't know if Ray did, but she could have, or we all could have gone back and still answered questions after that time frame. Um, I personally didn't, but the post is still live for a while after that, but we just had that dedicated time when we were answering questions and we made it clear when that was done. Um, and that's, I think, pretty typical. I think a good point about the going live, that can be for as long as you want. Uh, there's no set like time frame that you need to be actively answering questions. We just consider like this live time when you're actively promoting it and trying to get engagement. And then if you're done after like 45 minutes, you can edit and just be like, thanks for the, the, the questions. Um, here are some more resources and it's really up to you. Like there's no one telling you that you have to be there for a set time, which is really nice. And, and then I guess it's available for, for people to, to search on from there on out. Yeah, so here is the post actually. Um, I, hope you can, I hope you can see what I think you can see. But so the post is still here. I think it's locked now. They lock posts after a certain amount of time, and I'm not exactly sure what that amount of time is, but you can still see it and go through it and see all of the questions and all of the answers that we put in. Um, and also see that there were quite a few questions that we just didn't get to because there were too many. It's fascinating, thank you. Thank you. All right, we have about a minute left. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Laurel and or Hope? Okay, we'll go ahead and get set up for our next speaker. Thank you again, Laurel and Hope. I appreciate you all. Yeah, thanks. And if anyone has other questions, um, certainly feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to to chat more. So. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Fentina. And uh, Fentina, if you wanna come on and go ahead and start sharing, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Fantina Tzing. I work at the University of Porto in Portugal. The first author of this presentation is Fernando Correa. He is a PhD student and I'm his supervisor. 
I'm here to talk about wildfire risk and crisis communication to enhance communities resilience, and uh, I will present some evidence from, from Portugal. The, the deadly um, 2017 fire season left Portugal society shocked and appalled at the high number of fatalities and injured people. These consequences were associated among others with the lack of information about characteristics of extreme wildfires and the lack of preparedness of people to cope with such uh, events. All people that they experience uh, the, those extreme wildfires said uh, that never before they have seen a fires with such intensity, rate of spread and massive spotting. Thus, the purpose of this research was to identify the weaknesses of wildfire risk and emergency communication between municipalities and communities in Portugal. Another objective was to understand if 2017 wildfires experience influenced the engagement of municipalities in the improvement of the preparedness of citizens and communities to cope uh, with, um, with fires. The data used in the, this research were obtained through an, on, an online survey using a questionnaire that was sent to all the municipalities in Portugal that were not uh, urban areas. The response rate, uh, rate was 36%. Uh, the, we use um, to the qualitative and quantitative analysis conduct using NVivo, and uh, we identify also the, the, the municipalities that were affected by extreme wildfires uh, that answer the, the survey, and we try to analyze the influence of this experience in the practices of wildfire communication. The first finding of this research was that the term risk communication or emergency communication does not belong to the, to the terminology used by practitioners or policy makers in Portugal. The term awareness was recognized by most of the municipality staff that answered the questionnaire. However, no attention was given to inform citizens on the different characteristics of wildfires, the threats they represent to people and assets, and how to cope uh, with, uh, with them. One of the weaknesses on communication process um, was the dominance of passive means of communication that since the 80s have been demonstrated to be ineffective by scientific community. Most of the, the municipalities use their website to disseminate wildfire risk information is the main uh, way to inform uh, people. Direct contact with citizens mentioned by 86% of the municipalities appears more a way to disseminate the information aimed at compliance with the current legislation than a true interactive way to promote awareness and preparedness. The information disseminated by municipalities is mainly focused on inform people about the legislation on fuel management and fire use in order to assure the large, the large compliance. A serious difficulty faced by the municipalities in communication process is the lack of interest of citizens and communities that have the press assumption of being aware of problems and find no interest in the awareness raising actions. Risk communication and awareness raising campaigns are mainly seasonal and uh, there are high differences among municipalities. 
while some municipalities develop awareness actions through the whole year, there are others that do it heavily. This different behavior is not explained by diverse fire regimes, but by the importance the municipality staff attribute to the dissemination of wildfire risk information. Another finding was the lack of involvement on, uh, of municipalities during uh, wildfire. 43% of the municipalities involved in our survey try to provide information to citizens during a wildfire, but they do not have the adequate or expected information to disseminate. Concerning the, the importance the, of the communication to, to tourists, before wildfire outbreak, only 30% of the municipalities developed mentioned that they develop specific actions for tourists. However, during a fire, the concern of municipality for tourist safety obviously increased, and just 13% of the municipalities were not worried with tourist safety. When we compare the municipalities that had the experience of coping with the extreme wildfires with those without that experience, no relevant difference between the two groups were found. Maybe the only exception is that the staff of municipalities with experience in extreme wildfires seem more worried with the safety of people. Thus, they give a higher importance to the program Safe Village, Safe People, that pretend to be similar to the, U, the U, US fire adapt communities. This uh, Safe Village, Safe People was established in 2017 uh, with very high expectations, but uh, in fact, the implementation of the, this program is, um, is very, very low and with uh, um, practically no effective impact. In conclusion, we can, uh, can say that wildfire disaster risk communication between municipalities and communities in Portugal has, has many weaknesses, explained by the reduced um, um, municipalities' competencies on wildfire communication fixed by law. The attitude of new, the municipality staff is to disseminate information and clarify people mainly on the legal commitments without any interest in considering the opinion of citizens and communities and how people interpret that the information municipalities give them. Wildfire risk communication is rare, incoherent, and basically ineffectual at creating a generalized awareness of wildfire risk in cities and communities, as well as to prepare people to cope with fires, mainly the extreme, the extreme one. Portugal remains underprepared for increasingly frequent extreme wildfire events. So uh, a season similar or events similar to the ones that happened in 2017 can happen in future. We don't know when, uh, but it's possible that they, uh, they happen sometime in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. We have about 10 minutes uh, for any questions to be asked. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves and um, speak to Fundina while we're here. And I'm also gonna check the chat while we're waiting. See if any questions came through there.
Don't be scared. It's safe to come to Portugal, even in summer. Would love to do that. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q and A right now. But again, feel free to unmute if you would like to ask your question. Any questions from anyone? All right, everyone. Well, we are going to uh, take a quick break uh, before we come back to our next speaker, Ivan, uh, at the top of the hour. So about an eight minute break. Um, if you have any questions, though, in this moment while we're waiting that you would like to ask any of our speakers, please feel free to unmute. Uh, we're just going to wait for that next, uh, that next subsession to start uh, in case any people are planning to join to hear Ivan speak. So uh, feel free to unmute and ask any of your speakers any questions you may have.
Hi, Ivan, are you with us? I am here. Oh, let's go ahead and get your presentation started. Um, I just want to make sure that you're set up uh, with your PowerPoint uh, before I pass it over to you. Thank you. you should be able to share your screen. Can you see my screen? We can. All right. Perfect. So let's give it about another minute before we get you started. But thank you for being here with us. I'm very excited to hear your presentation. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to get started again in about one minute. Stay with us for another minute and we'll get started. All right, let's go ahead and get you started, Ivan. I'm gonna pass the mic over to you and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. So hello everyone. My name is Ivan Eduardo Alonso Ramirez and I'm a little nervous because it's my first Congress in another language and my English is not very good, <clears throat> but I'm ready here and I will try to do my best. Okay. I'm a geography student at the University of Guanajuato in the state of Guanajuato, Mexico. And I'm here to tell, to tell you about IGNIS, an application that is changing the way uh, we respond to wildfires here in Mexico. Uh, forest fire are an issue here. We didn't have a system in place in real time to detect fires. They were already huge. Uh, that's why Professor Michel Farfan and I who work in the engineering division of my university, developed this cell phone application together using citizen science, a uh, relatively uh, new approach here in Mexico. Uh, IGNIS, a tool for citizen fire reporting, is easy to use, and the technology can be implemented around the world. So let me tell you a little bit about why it developed, in the, it, developed it in the first place. Okay, last year was a year of many forest fires. It is estimated that around 5,000 hectares of grassland and forest were burned in the state of Guanajuato. In Mexico, we received alert of hotspots within the satellite early warning system of CONAVIO, the National Commission for the Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity, which has operated since 2000. However, this early warning system only detects uh, large fires and this inaccuracy compromises ecosystems. And by the time the satellites report, and the fire has already grown to, to a size of 50 hectares. And this is where participative citizen science comes into play. This collective approach integrates the work of scientists or decision makers with the common citizen for the collaborative construction of knowledge. And we developed the IGNIS app to report and record fires at a more local scale and of a size smaller than 50 hectares, as well as to involve society in the resolution of environmental problems. I developed IGNIS in conjunction with Michel Farfan who is a full-time professor in the Department of Geomatics and Hydraulics at the University of Guanajuato. She specializes in forest fires, urban green areas, and special modeling with the Dynamica Ego program. 
Uh, our application for its Android version uh, was developed on MIT's free-to-use platform App Inventor. And in Mexico, there are more states that have five reporting applications. The government of Veracruz developed Incendios Ignis, uh, and Michoacán has Eranani. Uh, but IGNIS is a nonprofit initiative from academia with the sole objective of producing research. Therefore, the data obtained uh, from the reports are openly available for consultation and download. And the application is available on the Play Store and the App Store for download. And IGNIS has a home screen and then a menu screen. The first button is to go to the report screen, and the second one directs you to Ignis website. And finally, the third button talks about uh, the alternative uses uh, you can give to Esquilmo, which is agricultural waste. Uh, these alternatives include repurposing it for cattle feed and reincorporating it into the soil as organic matter, among others. <clears throat> Burning Esquilmo is a common method of disposal and is classified as a crime in the state of Guanajuato. So how it works or generate a report in IGNIS? Well, the first field on the report page is for the user's name, which is optional because as I mentioned, the burning of Esquilmo is a crime. And then there are the date and the time fields, which the application fills in automatically. And then you're asked to select the type of fire you are reporting. The types of fire that are, that are possible to choose from are forest fires, which are handled by the National Forestry Commission, CONAFOR, and the Skilmo and Grassland Fires, handled by the Ministry of Environment and Territorial Planning. So the next field corresponds to the municipality. This field is mandatory because uh, it will allow directing the report to the municipal authority in charge of that type of fire. And the next field corresponds to the municipality. This field, uh, sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, the next step corresponds to the location of the fire. And to do this, you click on the red icon that will redirect you to a second screen with a map. And once you've been redirected to the location screen, okay, and you press the GPS button if you want to calculate your position automatically, which is ideal if the fire is close to you. If on the other hand, the fire is at a considerable distance, you can move around the map. And when you've located the place of the fire, you click on it and the red icon will be placed automatically and then click on confirm location to return to the report screen. And the penultimate step for a report will be to take a photograph of the fire. This photograph is asked to be as explicit as possible because it will help the firefighters with an idea of the magnitude of the fire and therefore to arrive better prepared to fight it. And finally, we press the send report button. Well, all the information we enter is attached in an email body, along with a link to Google Maps with the coordinates of the fire. And this report arrives in real time to the agencies in charge of fighting the fire. Well, all the data generated by reports are available to consult and download on the incendiosignis.com website. And these data are available in multiple formats, such as an Excel table, a comma separated files, or for using geographic information system in the shape file format. A, a map is also available that shows the fire reported by the IGNIS app, as well as other cartographic products like a forest fire risk map 
uh, for the scale of Guanajuato at the scale of one to 50,000. And IGNIS was launched to the public in December 2020. And to date has a total of 397 active users, as well as more than 300 reports generated during the last fire season, 2020 to 2021. And we hope that for this season, which is about to begin, uh, we can increase the number of users. So the IGNIS app has different downloadable uh, version for other municipalities, such as Ayula in the state of Jalisco and Urapan in the state of Michoacán. And in Guanajuato's case, it's available at the state level. Uh, so if you are a government official and are interested in an IGNIS app for your state, county, or municipality, we will be happy to develop the first IGNIS app in the United States. So don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, uh, the citizen participation is fundamental in the fight against wildfires. It creates a database that allows us to diagnose and model the risk, and also to locate uh, areas with high incidences of fire. And the success of IGNIS is only possible thanks to citizen participation and the dissemination of the application in the media. So, IGNIS relies on the general law of sustainable forest development to rotate the citizen, the citizen report. And IGNIS collaborates with governmental uh, agencies at every level. At the municipal level, we work with civil protection of all municipalities in the state of Guanajuato, and with the firefighters of city of Guanajuato, as well as firefighters from Sayula and the Fire Management Center of Michoacán. And at the state level, we collaborate with, with, with the Secretary of the Environment and Territorial Planning and with the Michoacán State Forestry Commission. And at the federal level, we collaborate with the National Forestry Commission. So the development of IGNIS uh, contributes to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in Objective uh, 13, Climate Action, and 15, preservation of life on Earth. And so thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to say goodbye with a quote from Nobel laureate in chemistry, Dr. Mario Molina. A scientist can raise the problems that will affect the environment based on the available evidence, but their solution is not the responsibility of scientists. Of scientists. It is the whole of society. So thank you very much. If anyone has any question or comments, go ahead. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I wanna welcome exactly what was just said. Please feel free to unmute, uh, turn your camera on if you would even like and uh, ask any questions that you may have. Now I'm going to check for our Q and A and see if anyone sent you any questions. Okay, I'm not currently seeing any questions from anyone, but again, feel free to unmute if you would like to. Okay, I'm currently not seeing any questions. So uh, I'm gonna say that we're gonna go ahead and close this session. Uh, I wanna thank you so much for uh, being here and for speaking with us. Everyone, we're gonna take about eight minutes before our next speaker um, begins. Our next speaker is Samantha Brooks. So uh, take about eight minutes before that next one starts. So everyone. And Samantha, are you with us? Yes, I am. All right. We'll get started in just a bit with you. Great, thank you.
All right, everyone, we are going to get started with our next se session, uh, subsession within uh, the next few minutes. Uh, Samantha, if you would like to come on camera and get ready to have your presentation set up so we can get started. Excellent, thank you. And then we'll give it about another minute before we get started. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Samantha, I do have us at time. So if you would like to get started. Great, right, thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, my name is Samantha Brooks and I'm a nutrition faculty at the University of Idaho. My research primarily focuses on wildland firefighters. Um, contrary to your research on actual fire environments, um, I studied the human subject, so the wildland firefighter. Um, specifically, I look at body composition exercise physiology and performance parameters, as well as nutrition. And so today I'd like to share with you some of our formative nutrition research related to feeding wildland firefighters and how we feed wildland firefighters and what our data has demonstrated thus far. And the title of my presentation today is Nutrient Intake of Wildland Firefighters During Arduous Wildfire Suppression, Macronutrient and Micronutrient Consumption. And this is a collaborative effort. I should mention with multiple co-authors, most of which are at the National Technology and Development Program in Missoula, Montana, as well as some of our researchers here at the Human Performance Laboratory at the University of Idaho. Just to give you an overview of what I'll be discussing today, an introduction of the energy expenditure and nutrient intake in wildland firefighters, what previous literature has demonstrated, as well as the methodology for this specific study, the results from this study, the discussion of pertinent literature, as well as the concluding arguments and any time for questions that we might have. So first and foremost, just to give you a basic introduction, um, total energy expenditure or the amount of calories it takes to perform arduous tasks like wildly and firefighting has been previously demonstrated by multiple laboratories, mostly in the Western United States out of the University of Montana, Missoula, with um, Dr. Brent Ruby's research. This has demonstrated that the total energy expended during arduous wildfire suppression is an average of 3,000 to about 6,000 kilocalories per day, which can be up to 3.6 times an individual's resting metabolic rate or the amount of energy it takes for someone just to sustain daily life. So this is exponentially higher and a very rigorous occupation with energy expenditures that can range from ultra endurance events to similar to mountaineering events. Therefore, other researchers have demonstrated what is the total energy intake or are wildland firefighters consuming enough food stuffs to sustain this huge amount of energy expenditure, especially through multiple days of wildfire suppression or um, on a fire assignment and all the way across the summer. And so these individuals have demonstrated that Wildland firefighters consume approximately 2,500 to 4,500 um, calories per day. These studies were not done in conjunction with each other, so it's difficult to compare and contrast um, and match energy expenditure specifically, but you can see that these ranges are very high and the amount of calories expended and consumed can be very high. So what are the recommendations? What should wildland firefighters be eating? Macronutrient recommendations are broken down into three categories, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So first we'll talk about carbohydrates. 
the average macronutrient distribution range for carbohydrates is approximately 45 to 65 percent of an individual's total energy expenditure. But we talk about carbohydrates for um, arduous occupations or for sport performance purposes in terms of a relative um, nutrient. So the carbohydrates recommendations for this type of occupation may be somewhere in the six to 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram per day. Additionally, fat intake is broken down into the average macronutrient distribution range of 20 to 35% of total calories, while as protein is 10 to 35% of calories, the recommended daily allowance just to sustain daily living is to have a relative amount of protein, 0.8 grams per kilogram of your total dietary intake. Whereas for rigorous occupations and sports, it's more recommended that your protein intake is in the 1.2 to 1.8 gram per kilogram per day range or even greater, just to make sure that your skeletal muscle protein synthesis is optimal and you don't have any situations to break down. When we come to micronutrients, these are in terms of vitamins and minerals. Um, vitamins and minerals have specific recommendations. Every vitamin and mineral has its own recommendation for males and females, as well as for your specific age range. However, for wildland firefighters or for any type of occupation or sport, there are no micronutrient recommendations that exceed those of overall health. Most literature recommends that you consume more my vitamins and minerals, given that you are expending more energy, but the actual quantities are unknown. So in terms of feeding wildland firefighters, there's the National Mobile Food Services contract, which I'll abbreviate as NMFS throughout because um, it's a mouthful. But this contract is revised every five years, and it is the foundation to what you are allowed to feed wildland firefighters during arduous wildfire suppression. So the main thing is there are breakfast and dinner that are located at a centralized camp of some sort, whereas the sack lunch, which is termed shift food provisions, encompasses 11 items in total, one main entree, seven trail items, each with their own specifications in terms of total calories and macronutrient distribution, and then three fruits and vegetables. Um, wildland firefighters often bring their own supplemental items as well, which we may get into in this PowerPoint, um, and this is revised in 2025 again. So therefore, the main research question for this specific manuscript was, does the National Mobile Food Services contract provide an adequate amount of nutrients to wildland firefighters? Because if the food stuff is not provided, then it cannot be consumed. The second question thereafter would be, do wildland firefighters consume adequate nutrients to sustain high energy expenditures during wildfire suppression? So how much of what's provided are they actually eating? And the third question is, how do these provided versus consumed nutrient intakes compare to the recommended daily allowances or what an individual should be eating for overall health? So the methodology for this study, um, the Participants in this study, there were 122, both males and females, on 12 incidents across six different regions during the 2018 wildfire season. It took us a few years to get this into press, so it's a few seasons behind. This is pre-COVID stuff. Um, and a researcher who was previously a wildland firefighter has red card experience. The whole nine yards was assigned to one individual. And so it was a one-to-one -one ratio where a researcher followed a wildland firefighter for the entire day and noted everything that they did and everything that they ate and put it all into an iPad on site. Then um, all of the caterers, specific caterers menus were entered into um, a certain software called ESHA and then analyzed in terms of macronutrient and micronutrient consumption. For this specific study provided is going to be denoted as food offered by caterers via this contract, whereas consumed is ingested by the wildland firefighters as well as the supplemental items that they may have brought with them. And then these data were compared to the recommended daily allowances. The statistical analyses for this study were descriptive statistics as well as paired t-tests to determine differences between what was provided and what was consumed on the fire line. The results of this study, you can see in table one, the participant demographic characteristics. I just like to point out that it was predominantly male with about 20% female, which seems standard for this occupation and in other literature. These data are represented as mean standard deviations and the individuals were of a normal body mass and the average age of about 27 from multiple different crew types. It was spread across. 
This is a very large table, but what I'd like to point out to you is that the top section is the male macronutrient intake, as well as the bottom section is female. There were significant differences in provided and consumed um, dietary intakes for calories and protein, as well as fiber, fat, and the omegas for males. Additionally, there were significant differences in provided versus consumed for females for calories, protein, fat, and the omegas as well. This next table is of the male micronutrient intake outcomes. So you can see there were significant differences in provided versus consumed for vitamins D, A, K, and choline, um, as well as a few others, some of the B vitamins too. But it's important to note, moreover, that the percent of the recommended daily allowance was not met by provided and consumed vitamins and minerals for a number of nutrients for males. So for vitamin D, magnesium, manganese, choline, vitamin A, and vitamin E, all of these did not meet the recommended daily allowance just for overall life um, in terms of the provided and consumed. Additionally, this table is in reference to female micronutrient outcomes. You can see that there were significant differences between provided and consumed for zinc, sodium, phosphorus, magnesium, selenium, and some of the B vitamins. It's also important to note that numerous um, vitamins and minerals did not meet the percent RDA for the female wildland firefighters either. So vitamin D, choline, um, vitamin A, as well as vitamin E. So some of the same vitamins and minerals as for the males were not met in sufficient quantities for the provided or consumed. So what does all of this mean for the discussion? I'd like to point out that the differences in provided versus consumed can point us in directions for some targeted nutrition education materials. First of all, in the instances where the amount provided by, wild, by caterers greatly exceeds the amount consumed, that's an opportunity to educate the caterers in terms of wasting products or providing food items that the wildland firefighters don't actually want. Um, and then also pointing out directions for what food items can you offer that will help boost those areas that are below the recommended daily allowances. Also for wildland firefighter nutrition education, if they're under consuming what's provided, um, that's an opportunity to point them in some direction as to which foodstuffs would be best to eat to optimize these vitamins and minerals. And for the vitamins and minerals that fell below the recommended daily allowance, so they're not meeting the minimum number of um, vitamins and minerals to sustain daily living. And this doesn't even come into consideration with wildland firefighters exposed to altitude, smoke, stresses, um, long work hours and lack of sleep. All of these require additional vitamins and minerals as well. So these are specifically of concern. Vitamin D is one of our main targets currently with wildland firefighters. As you might know, most individuals obtain their vitamin D through direct sunlight on their skin. However, with all of this PPE that wildland firefighters have to wear, their skin is not routinely exposed to sunlight. So they might need to either consume more vitamin D rich foods in their diet or have periods of sun exposure. It's unknown at this time. And this also gives us a direction for the contract revisions, which will be rolled out in 2025. So I am part of a crew that's on this paper mostly, who is responsible for making these recommendations and rewriting what is in the contract. So it's always changing and we're adapting based on what has happened in previous seasons or what we hear colloquially from wildland firefighters as well as what's published in the literature. So to conclude, the National Mobile Food Services contract does provide adequate macronutrients, so overall calories, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids for wildland firefighter suppression. However, if you take a look at the micronutrients for overall health, wildland firefighters are not being provided and are also not consuming a decent handful of those micronutrients for overall health, let alone their occupational stressors that we've talked about. And our research now is trying to focus at looking at wildland firefighters as a whole. Most of the literature thus far has isolated wildland firefighters to either just 
fire assignments or over the fire season. But we know that the wildfire season is becoming more arduous and strenuous and increasing in length. So we're trying to look into how is this impacting the wildland firefighter as a whole, both in the in season and in the off season to try to determine how to optimize their health and performance moving forward as a firefighter and as an individual. With that, I would take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Samantha. I am taking a look at your Q&A now. I'm not seeing any questions yet, but I want to welcome anyone who would like to ask any questions to please unmute and ask your questions at this time. Okay, we're going to do a last call for any questions for Samantha. Just doing one more last check on Hoover for you. Okay, well, Samantha, I'm not seeing anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and move us on um, and end this session, unless anyone else has any other questions at this time. Last call for any questions. All right, well, I wanna uh, start by thanking all of our speakers. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise and your voice today. We really appreciate it, uh, and this experience has been great. This session will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the Congress ends. Up next, we have our poster session starting at 3 p.m. that is centered around the Congress theme of Life with Fire. Many poster presenters will be available to chat with live or answer questions on their posters, so be sure to check it out. To access the poster presentations, please click on the agenda tab and select posters. We hope you join us for some great networking and discussion opportunities this evening. Beginning at 5 p.m. Eastern time, we will have a few fire circle discussion sessions, our annual AFE member meet, members meeting in an open house and our we've got a movie, we got a movie sign network session. To choose the one you'd like to join, use the agenda tab on the left of your screen and click session and click the main session title to join. Also remember to participate in the passport contest by visiting and engaging with our virtual exhibitor booths. Simply click exhibitors in the navigation bar. Attendees with the most stamps will be entered into a drawing to win a free Fire Congress registration for 2023. All right, thank you all again. Thank you to our speakers and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye.